Hi, I'm Katie Green. Hi, I'm Dan Green. And welcome back to the Green Again podcast. And today we're joined by Stefan Kinsella. Uh, Stefan is a registered patent attorney, a libertarian theorist and lecturer, and a director for the Centre of the Study of Innovative Freedom. Stefan, thanks so much for coming on the show. I'm glad to do it. Awesome. So, Stefan, Dan and I are obviously familiar with you and what you do. Uh, But for people listening who might not be as familiar, could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be a libertarian? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And uh, you may be able to tell from my surname that it's uh, Irish, so it's pronounced Kinsella in uh, in Ireland. But over here, yeah, we do say Kinsella (laughs) over here. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, It's not one I've heard, you know, my obviously family name being Irish, but no, it's not one I've heard before. Wow. Kin- yeah, Kinsella. it's pretty common over there. I've been to Ireland and uh, yeah. see Kinsella hardware and things like that. Uh, or I think it's a uh, it's the same root as Kinsley or Kinsleyock or something like ah, that. So, right. Oh, I see. Oh, right. I see. Yeah, my family are way from the north. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, so I'm a patent attorney in Houston, Texas. I'm from Louisiana originally in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, and have been interested in libertarian and free market ideas since. Uh, I was about 15 or 16 years old, and uh, yeah. I got steadily more interested in it um, as I went to um, to law school and uh, became a practicing attorney. Um, and see, when you became an IP like attorney, what were your views on IP at that time? An IP attorney. <laughs> yeah, so I, I started practicing law, like oil and gas law at first, actually, originally in 1992 or so. And then quickly moved into patent law because it was uh, a booming field in the early 1990s in the U.S. I was an electrical engineer background, and uh, uh, people with certain technical specialties were heavily recruited. So I moved into that field, and I was also becoming uncomfortable with the pro-patent, pro-copyright arguments by some libertarians like Ayn Rand and others. And so I started looking into it more, especially because I was going to practice it as part of my career. And uh, I pretty soon became persuaded after – well, I did a lot of research. I did a lot of reading. I mean hundreds of law review articles and books (laughs) and things And uh, because I was trying to find a way to justify it because I was going to practice this. Um, So I was desperately circling around just finding anything I could that was a good argument for IP, and (laughs) I finally gave up when I realized that it's – it's basically a, a huge colossal mistake and completely <laughs> c- contrary to property rights and free market and competition. So uh, about the time that I got registered to practice as a patent attorney, um, I was pretty much persuaded that it was an illegitimate type of field. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's funny. Kate was poking me because I said IP attorney and I was like, what? And then I was like, oh, no. <laughs> um, he, meant, he meant patent attorney. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um so, Stefan, well, let's talk about property rights. Why, in your view, is IP um, a violation of property rights? So I, I've been thinking about this for a good 17, 20 plus years now, and um, I have had lots of debates with other libertarians and regular people, and you start seeing trends of how you have how discussions go and what people are thinking of and how you can persuade people or really what are gaps in your own thinking. And... Um, I think that uh, people combine things when they when they're pro free market when they're pro individual they're pro they're, they're just generally pro liberty they're pro freedom yeah um, and they see for example that if you have a free market system that it tends to produce good results you know prosperity cooperation technology yeah and so all these things just become blended in their minds and so some people focus on well, they, they see that property rights give the right incentive structure, and so they start thinking, well, that's the purpose of political uh, reasoning is to come up with the right incentives to induce people to do the right things because yeah. that is pretty much what happens in a free market. Um, I think that's basically a mistaken um, avenue. It, 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 it misleads us. Uh, there is some truth to it, but I ultimately think that the purpose of property rights – is to respond to the fundamental fact of what um, Hans Hermann Hoppe calls scarcity in the world or rivalrousness. The fact that there are certain things in the world that we need to use to get along in life, but yeah. that only one of us can use at a time, which gives rise to the possibility of conflict. And to the extent we want to be civilized and live in society with each other and be cooperative, we need to find a set of rules that can tell us 
look, who gets to use this scarce resource? So the entire purpose of property rights is a response to the fundamental fact of scarcity. Um, and the system of property rights that libertarians favor is basically along Lockean contractual free market um, lines. And once you understand the purpose of property rights like that, like you realize that we wouldn't need property rights if we were all super invulnerable or we were ghosts who couldn't conflict with each other or yeah. there was infinite infinite abundance. If, if any of those things happened, you wouldn't even need property rights. There wouldn't be a possibility of conflict. Yeah. But in the real world, there is, and that's the purpose of property rights, is to come up with a set of rules that allows us to get along with each other and to have cooperation and the division of labor and prosperity. Once you understand that, it, it seems to me pretty clear that intellectual property is completely contrary to that because intellectual property is the state coming in and changing the structure of ownership that already exists naturally. and it assigns an ownership right to someone who's not a producer, who's not a um, uh, an appropriator of the resource, who's not a contractual owner of the resource, and it gives them the right to control how the resource is used, um, which is a recipe for conflict and a recipe for um, 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 uh, you know a special you know, influence over the over the government. So to my mind, intellectual property, especially patent and copyright, is basically a type of theft because it gives what I call a negative servitude, which you would call in Scotland because you have a civil law system similar to Louisiana, uh -huh. right, yeah. which we call an easement in um, the common law. Um, it gives a negative servitude to someone who does not – who did not contractually acquire that servitude. So it gives your neighbor basically the right to use the courts to prevent you from using your own resources the way you see fit, which is a type of property right. Yeah. And that's the fundamental problem with intellectual property is that it's an assignment of property rights by the state that takes property rights away from the owner and gives it to third parties who did not contractually acquire those property rights. Well, yeah, because um, and I believe it's um, a point you make in the book, actually, against intellectual property. Um, you make the point that if, say, for example, I write a novel and I own the copyright to that pattern of words, but then you take you know, your paper and your ink and you copy that out, that exact pattern of words, then somehow you're breaking the law, you're violating copyright, even though that's your property you're doing it on. Yeah, and I think in a way... I used to think that model was specific to intellectual property, and so I would classify – so the state classifies intellectual property, and the advocates of intellectual property have come up with this term, intellectual property. It didn't used to be that term. It just used to be uh, there was patent law, there was copyright law, there was trade secret law, yeah. there was trademark law, and, and the proponents of these types of laws and the government started lumping them together under the concept intellectual property law to – to call them property rights, to appeal to people's natural, um, um, you know, um, ideals in favor of property yeah. rights, um, and so I was thinking that really what they have in common is that they are all examples of negative servitudes. But the more I think about it, I think this is true of almost every state regulation. Now Rothbard, in I think in the Ethics of Liberty or For a New Liberty, has a way of dividing the way government interferes with society. One's called a binary intervention where the state takes property from someone for itself. Okay, That's right. like basically theft. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the other is triangular intervention where the state tells A that they can't do a deal with B in a certain way. Yeah. So the minimum wage law, for example. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So in a sense, I think intellectual property is just one subset of a type of um, – probably triangular intervention by the state it's an interesting way to look at it yeah i hadn't really thought about it that way yeah and actually i believe it goes way back doesn't it does it not go back to england as a lot of these things like central banking and that that are now plaguing us do right so you could look at banking you could look at uh, um, i mean any number of statutes uh, even even like a law that bans uh flag burning or, or yeah. even the, dr the drug laws. The drug laws mm. are, in a sense, a type of uh, negative servitude because the state is asserting ownership over your body. 
Yes. They're saying that you can't use your body in the following way. Yeah. E- even though it's not uh, – that 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 action you're wanting to perform is not an act of aggression against someone else. It's just yes. consuming drugs or whatever. So pretty much every illegitimate government action can be characterized as some type of negative servitude or something like that. Um, so I guess the IP ones are the subset that deals with the so-called intellectual creations of the mind, like reputation rights in terms of defamation law yeah. um, or trademark or copyright or patent <clears throat> trade secret. Yeah, it's funny because I remember um, it was Rothbard, wasn't it, when he was talking about, um, believing it's in foreign new liberty, when he's talking about, you know, like libel laws and stuff like that. And he's saying, well, <laughs> you can't own your reputation because that's just something that exists in other people's heads. So you can't control that. So, you know, you don't own your reputation. Right. And I think there he had the right instinct and the right analysis. Yeah. I don't think he, I don't think he recognized that reputation rights or a type of intellectual property in fact that's not widely recognized today um yeah but if you understand the basis and the nature of these laws that you can see a lot of similarities between uh, reputation rights and uh, copyright and patent mm-hmm. um and rothbard if he had carried his analysis out further and been consistent then the same arguments he applied against reputation rights could have been used to argue against patent, trademark, trade secret, and copyright laws. Mm-hmm. Um, and he pretty much opposed patent laws, but he tried to come up with some kind of contractual argument in favor of copyright. Um, I think this is where Rothbard uh, – he was such a wide reader. He was so smart. But when you read so much, and there's only so much to read, and, <laughs> you, and you're, you're, you're operating without a net – to a degree when you're such a pioneer like he was sometimes you maybe um uh, overstep your bounds or you or you um you go too far in your assumptions and he confused three things i believe he he uses the word copyright to argue in favor of what he calls contractual copyright or common law copyright Mm -hmm. the problem is copyright as it's normally understood applies to um, original expressions of ideas not to inventions, patents cover inventions. And yet his example of a mousetrap, which could be covered by his copyright, is an invention. So it's, that's, that's a confusion right there. Right, Second of yeah. all, he uses the term common law copyright. But common law copyright was a distinct doctrine in the law, which I think he probably wasn't aware of. He probably came up with the term again on his own to refer to something else. But common law copyright is really more like trade secret. It simply meant if you have an unpublished manuscript in your desk drawer and someone takes that manuscript and is about to publish it at the printer, you can stop them from doing that. Um, that is almost nothing to do with modern copyright. And it's, <laughs> yeah. it's more similar to what we call trade secret law now. Um, and third, he, he was really talking about what he would call contractual copyright. Um, and his mistake there, I think, is the idea that you could use contract to come up with a type of property right that would simulate or look like patent or copyright. It wasn't really clear what he was going for there. I think if he had been consistent, he would have realized that that was a dead end and that really is incompatible with the the, the bulk of the rest of his views on property rights and scarcity and reputation rights. Yeah, yeah, no, I can absolutely see what you mean. Um, and that's that's quite an interesting subject actually when you get into it and it has become like quite a source of debate obviously because we know Ayn Rand was like kind of fiercely <laughs> in favour of property rights you know some people would maybe even say to a well she was quite, an objectivist I mean well, what to, do you kind of expect yeah, to like, an extreme like, degree it's know. <laughs> you know no I so Ayn Rand was um, um, I mean Rothbard was on the right track he just didn't quite finish it and he just wasn't an IP expert. Um, he had tantalizing insights, and he had some good criticisms of patent law. Mm-hmm. But Ayn Rand was another case. Um, I mean, I started out as a Randian. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah, in, in high school, and uh, I still admire a lot of her thought. Oh, yeah. Oh, we, we, of we course, like yes, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I just think her two big mistakes were the government and IP, actually. Um, um, I can ag- course- yeah, I can agree. I definitely think her political – me and her don't really get on – politically <laughs> Apart from well that. i think uh, if you put it in context of what she was 
fighting against in the times. Uh, mm. She overemphasized the selfishness thing because she saw altruism was a bigger problem, and maybe it was a bigger problem in the in the intellectual realm at the time. Nowadays, I don't think it's the same problem. I don't really think we're drowning in an orgy of self-sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, you know, her criticisms of of, of anarchy were just kind of uh, non-serious and flippant, yeah. which yeah. is arrogant. Yeah. Um, and intellectual property was her big mistake. She has some comments that you know she was against initiation of force. She recognized that it's physical force against people's physical bodies and their physical possessions that is really the fundamental problem of society. And that's why she endorsed the non-aggression principle. But she didn't take that reasoning to its end because she has this almost mystical notion that the purpose of life for man is to create values. And she imbues the term values with this kind of metaphysical reality, like the, the real things you're creating, like a substance that you create, and therefore you own it. And that gives rise to the whole idea of IP. And actually, I think that mistake started with Locke. So I think that ultimately the fundamental mistake we made was traced back to Locke. And Ayn Rand and others were infected by that way of looking at it, an overly metaphorical, imprecise way of uh, – envisioning the fundamental social problem it's it's just not precise enough and it leads to these um to these uh mistakes in my opinion yeah i would tend to agree with you actually um we actually had a uh, lauren rumpler on and she runs objectivistgirl.com and it's funny because um she's an objectivist obviously but um she actually talks a lot in her YouTube videos about how she feels that objectivism is actually compatible with anarchism, you know, sort of in spite of what Ayn Rand says. And it's quite an interesting perspective. I think it I, I, I think I'm an objectivist because if you look at the four fundamental principles of objectivism that Ayn Rand herself laid out, mm -hmm. it was uh, 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 reality and reason and, and individualism and capitalism. Yeah. And in a in the general stated generally, I mean, any reasonable person I think who's not a misanthrope, uh, yeah. pretty much has to agree with all those. So it's just that capitalism <laughs> implies anarchy. I think she didn't take it that far. Yeah, she she, she didn't take it far enough. Then really, she just didn't go. <laughs> oh, because oh, yeah, enough. because I kind of think. And I'm sure you would agree that, like, um, sort of, even if you talk about libertarianism, I mean, anarcho-capitalism is the logical conclusion, because we know that limited government is it's a fairy tale, you know, because government by its nature has to grow. Yes, I, and and that's what you know. Even the public choice theorists and people like Hans Hermann Hoppe and uh, Bertrand de Juvenal and Gustave de Bolinari, they all recognize this. Um, the objectivists sometimes take the side of the mainstream and they criticize anarchists for being naive or utopians. And I'm wondering what planet do they live on because yeah. they're in favor of this uh, so called limited government. And if you point out that it's never existed in the history of mankind and that there's all kinds of economic reasons to believe that it's not stable and unlikely to stay limited, even if it was ever to become limited in the first place. They'll kind of wave their hands and say, well, the early United States was close to paradise. And I'm thinking, like, except for the blacks, except yeah. for the, yeah. the Indians, and except for the women. And it's, yeah. just, it's just too rosy a view of one episode in history, yeah. um, I think. Well, see, yeah, because... I know some people have said that to me when I talk about anarcho-capitalism. They've said, oh, it's utopian, but I don't think it is at all. If you actually read seriously about anarcho-capitalism, no one's talking about a utopia whatsoever. They're saying there will be problems. We're not even sure how some things will be, you know, accomplished, but, you know, it's going to be a much better system than having this gang called a government, you know? Well, yeah, I, I, I actually think that... Um... I'm always perplexed by that criticism too. You'll you'll hear routinely that oh, you libertarians, um, the problem with your views is you're counting upon humans to be angels or something like that, right? They 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 think that our uh, yeah. theories assume that people would be perfect angels, and I'm thinking that that's mm. really never what we're assuming. We're assuming no. that people are flawed and we will commit crimes, mm -hmm. and if you give the power of organized violence. 
to these leaders of the government, then they're even more dangerous. Uh, yeah. So to me, it's really realistic uh, uh, to, 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 to be afraid of uh, giving the power of the state to real human beings. I absolutely agree, and I, I really struggle with this on a day-to-day basis. Struggle's actually the wrong word. I think about this on a day-to-day basis, and mm-hmm. I just feel that um, I don't think people are angels, but I think common decency is 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 not is a natural thing and we are obviously flawed we will commit crimes but it's so funny that i i don't i think people are weird because they don't get it <laughs> well yeah because you say to people um they say oh well if we remove laws then people will like laws as they see them they'll be like oh well if we remove government we'll remove law and people will be killing each other in the streets <laughs> and raping each other and all these kind of things and we say well is your idea of morality based on you know the what law given to you by <laughs> these people you know these people of all people you know and it's crazy yeah what do they say are you projecting you know <laughs> is, that, is that what you would do or what you want to do um yeah no i well i think sometimes we have to recognize that i mean the human race is really really well the human race is old but human society is young i mean we've oh, really yeah. only been civilized to a certain extent for what seven thousand years or something, and yeah. and that's on top of hundreds of thousands or more of of evolution. So we're a very young species. Yeah. Uh, intelligence apparently is a very furious force and is accelerating rapidly. Um, it's amazing what we've accomplished, but the fact that we have a society and a culture um, at all shows that most people, for whatever reason, are basically. Uh, I don't want to say decent, but they they yeah. tend towards cooperative, and they don't really want to hurt each other. They want to work, get along with each other. Um, we couldn't have what we've achieved so far if we hadn't had a basic tendency of mankind. Now, I believe in free will, so I don't believe in determinism in the sense that we're not basically good or evil. I don't think that kind of question makes sense. That's just my personal yeah. philosophical view. I, I think that 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 question is a deterministic question that belies the the fact of free will. I don't think we're basically good or evil because that means there's a tendency one way or the other, and people aren't really in control of their actions. But I think that they are. I just think that the way human society works, the way the universe works, the way entropy works, that there's a good reason for humans to cooperate with each other by and large. People have empathy. They want to cooperate. There are going to be some outliers. Yep. So even if we eliminate the state as an institutionalized <clears throat> source of aggression… I think you can expect there to be some scattered private crime on occasion, and people will deal with that as a technical problem as part of life, just like we deal with disease and hurricanes and wild animals. It just has to be dealt with. Um, But it doesn't mean that uh, we're utopian, but it doesn't mean that we're naive, Um, but it it does mean that the state wouldn't be there as the big source of, of aggression. Yeah, it's it's interesting when you, when you were talking about that. I was just remembering one of my favorite things to do when I'm talking with, for example, I don't know if, in fact, I think she has said this to me. I'm talking to my mother, and she asked me a question like, uh, "Oh, in your sort of libertarian utopia, what would happen if a uh, if someone, I don't know, a man on drugs came into your house and wanted all your things?" The, the my favorite thing to say to her would be, "What would I do now?" Like, let's, let's, let's just go back here and think, what would I do at this moment in time? I would phone, obviously, the police or something, or I would fight back. I don't know. Yeah, you would and, fight back, Dan. Yeah, I would like, why would wouldn't fight. you have, like, a, why wouldn't a private, say, defense organization, like, be much better than the So there's, like, police? a private number I could phone and say, okay, and they would have a really, really quick response team, no matter where I lived or what area I lived in. You know, uh, or the owner of the road might hire security guards. I don't know, but these are really good things. It's good questions to ask people to well, to think, get them thinking about it. You know, they're they're doing what the uh, Chicago or the uh, the mainstream economists do. They're comparing the real world to some idealized model of perfect competition, yeah. and then the real world doesn't meet uh, meet up with their model and so then they say well then we have to have the government intervene yeah in, in this case they should be comparing real world a versus real world b instead of comparing real world b against utopia uh, some kind of utopian ideal <laughs> yeah because yeah so you're right so what would you do now and would it be would it be worse in a free society yeah I, exactly 
furthermore, you could imagine there's good reasons to believe there would be f far fewer of these problems in a free society for various reasons. I mean, yeah. fewer drug abusers, fewer people that needed to steal to have drugs because they would be so cheap. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. If, if what a block are cheap, is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, just g give them out to the people that need them just to keep them at bay. I mean, I don't see the problem. <laughs> <really>. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> Yeah, and that's quite an interesting question. And well, since we're going down this vein, um, how? Yeah, obviously we can't make predictions. You know, that's one thing I, I know that you know we hate as like anarchists. Like when people say, "Well, how exactly would this work?" and they expect you to be an expert in every sort of <laughs> level of how a society will work, and you're like, "Well, I don't know because it's quite far off." But yeah. um, how would you, in your opinion, <laughs> not prediction? Um, see a kind of legal system working in a sort of stateless anarcho-capitalist society? Well, I mean, I think the, the writers who've written thoughtfully on this to date uh, have given us good indications. You know, you got Bruno Leone, you have uh, uh, John Hasness, Randy Barnett, uh, uh, Gerard, Gerard Casey of late. Um, other writers um, have given us good ideas of what has happened in the past. And even what happens now, right? I mean, we have a polycentric legal order in the world right now to some degree. We have neighbors getting along with each other in certain ways now. So that gives us some indication. There's pr there's a huge domain of private law now, private law between neighbors, between countries, between uh, uh, entities in different countries trading internationally, right. the, the law merchant, the Lex Mercatoria. Um, these things give us an idea of what we could expect. Um, it reminds me of um, when you have a communist system, a totalitarian system, and people mm -hmm. are arguing against it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the objection would be, unless you can tell me how many brands of toothpaste there would be in a free society, <laughs> then we, I'm we, not we have doing to it. have <laughs> we have to maintain the state monopoly on the on the manufacture and sale of toothpaste. And I suppose a free market advocate could try to guess and say, okay, maybe there will be 15 brands, maybe it's five brands. And then, then of course, there will be a non-ending series of questions like, well, if there's five brands of toothpaste, how will the fourth one make a profit? Or what about a sixth guy who wants to enter the market? How is he going to – so they, they, they never end their que – their questions are never ending. They'll never be satisfied. And I think that that's, a, that, that's an indication to us that we have to be careful – yeah. Not to confuse questions with arguments. Questions are fine if they're sincere. Yeah. If they're loaded questions or if they're uh, rhetorical questions, they're usually a disguised argument. And yeah. I think if you want to make an argument, make an honest, explicit, open argument and back up your propositions and your assumptions. Uh, but they don't do that. They form them as questions. Same thing in the yeah. case of IP. They'll say, well, how is an artist supposed to make money? And the the implicit the implicit assumption there is that we have to come up with a system where artists can make enough money, whatever enough money means or whatever. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> so I'm always wary of loaded questions. Um, so we can try to answer them. And of course, my guess is that you would have uh, private legal systems would flourish. It wouldn't really be a big problem. Mm -hmm. um, lawyers. So I think say lawyers like my profession in a way would be more valuable and in a way less valuable because they're more valuable now because a huge bulk of them are dedicated towards interpreting the state uh, statutory scheme. Yeah. I, mean, is, I mean, I think I've just read, not to bring it to Scotland, but if Scotland somehow becomes independent, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. they <laughs> be employed for the next 40 years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that means like 13,000 treaties between the UK and other nations. Yeah. Literally yeah. 13,000. And so every wow. one of those has to be <laughs> sorted out. So the lawyers will have a field day. Oh, they'll Jeez. love it. <laughs> okay. Well, now I, now I know why. I have, a, I have a relative who's a lawyer, and he's a really, really he's campaigning for this big time, and now I know why. <laughs> oh, it's going to be a full employment campaign for attorneys. Whoa, uh, okay. There, well, so there <laughs> I think in the modern world, lawyers are more prevalent than they would be because of the need for navigating regulations and statutes and treaties sure. and constitutions and court decisions. But I also believe that in a free society, the richer the economy becomes and the greater the scope of the division of labor, then the more transactions um, happen on a bigger and bigger scale and the richer people are, then the more um, um, affordable it can be to hire an attorney 
to yeah. make the transaction a little bit more sophisticated. So I actually think the demand for attorneys would go up in a sure. free society. Sure. But on balance, I don't know what would happen because I think a lot of them right now are basically, in effect, employed by the state, like like me. In effect, I'm I'm, sure. I'm being paid because of the patent system, which if it if yeah. it didn't exist, the whole patent profession would just atrophy. Do a lot of your customers know about your views on IP just out of interest? <laughs> Uh, some of them do. They, I, you know, when I first started, uh, I was a, a, a new lawyer, and I was worried. I was actually kind of trying to state my views a little bit in a muted form, like academic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's just kind of an academic view, you know? <laughs> um, I was worried, but over time I realized that, <laughs> unfortunately, we libertarians are so small that no one cares what we think. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. I know. I, no, know. It's, I don't mean to be so cynical. They, they really just don't care. They don't care what – it's like – it's like say they care what your sexual uh, orientation or your religion yeah. is. People yeah. just want to have a competent professional. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in fact, what I've noticed is, well, first of all, I get lots of inquiries from people that are pissed off about the the injustices of the system and when they're attacked sure. by the, and so they want to hire someone who they think is on their side. So sure. that helps yeah. me in that side. And even people that are pro IP. They think if this guy has written and spoken a lot about this topic, he must know what he's talking about. Well, that's it. Yeah, sure. Of course. So I, can understand I haven't that. found that they they know, but they don't – I would say they don't care, but they, I think they tend to agree with me. They just don't think sure. about it too much. Sure. Everyone knows it's a game. Everyone knows it's, it's a joke <laughs> that patents are a big waste yeah. of time and effort. Yeah. But they do what they have to do to comply with the laws. Yeah, I can understand that. You know, people have to make a living, and oh yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, people criticized sort of Stefan Molyneux a while ago for what was it? He threatened someone on YouTube or something like that. With yeah, uh, yeah. But I then, mean, I don't. But, like... I don't want to go into that too much. I don't really know all the ins and outs of that. But <laughs> yeah. Um. And so that the hypocrisy issue is a different issue i think that's yeah. a distraction from the oh, substance yeah. um i agree i mean it, let's suppose i'm a hypocrite that doesn't mean patent laws are valid i can't <laughs> yeah sure I can't, uh, yeah. by my actions of hypocrisy make something become <laughs> legitimate in political yeah. theory it's just yeah, i don't have yeah. that power that's a magical power i don't possess um but personally i i look people don't understand ip law cuz it's a very very arcane uh, specialized doctrine. Yeah. Um, it's hyper compartmentalized and specialized. Um, I personally engage in activities that I regard as pretty much defensive in nature. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe you could come up with an argument that doing the other side would be morally unobjectionable. I just prefer to represent people in a defensive capacity. So yeah. morally, mm -hmm. I feel okay with it. Uh, but most people don't even understand that. I get criticisms from these know nothings that say, "Oh, you you go to court and you have a patent bar exam and you, you you sue people and they don't even know what I do. They just yeah, they yeah. Have yeah. all these insults, sure, uh, without knowing even what they're talking about because it's specialized and I understand that and they're in the dark. Yeah, if they would just ask me, I would tell them. If you want to have a thirty yeah. minute conversation, let me explain the boring field of patent law. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, but it, you have to have patience and lose your foaming at the mouth libertarian righteousness for just a few minutes <laughs> otherwise you just have to either take my word or, or don't i don't know but um yeah i, I personally only only uh, uh help people with the law defensively and I, I would i i would i would hope i would have the fortitude to turn down a client which i have done yeah to yeah. uh to to use the law aggressively i think it's completely um destructive and immoral so i i try not to do that but i have the sure. luxury personally in my life not to because i have developed a certain specialty in clientele and that i can ret i can refuse that type of work yeah someone who can't I, I i just my specialty in life is not to sit there and judge other individual actions yeah um if someone's a hypocrite or they use the law in a bad way to me it's not surprising we wouldn't oppose laws if people didn't use them so yeah. in other words, the copyright law wouldn't be a problem if everyone would voluntarily agree to ignore it. But once you have such a law, people are going to use it. The mm -hmm. problem is the law. 
And if you could point to 5,000 instances a day, and there's honestly, there's probably a million a day. I think there's like a million YouTube <laughs> takedown notices. Oh, wow. YouTube really? YouTube a day. Yeah, by these day. automated robots. That's crazy. It's, That's <laughs> awful. Like, like literally a million a day. That's that unbelievable. Oh. And so I guess you could point to one out of the million and make a big case out of it because the guy was a libertarian. But yeah. <laughs> I just don't see the principle or the point. Uh, it's not surprising. Yeah. I, no. So my focus is on theory and principles and um, not on criticizing people for not being perfect in their lives, I guess. Yeah. You know, I completely agree with you because that is a logical fallacy in itself. You know, like, you know, we talk about hypocrisy or whatever you want to call it. But the fact of the matter is, like, if I say that, that's what the logical fallacy is. If I say to someone, um, killing is wrong, but then I kill someone. I know it's a kind of extreme example, but that doesn't mean, it doesn't make what I said wrong. Exactly. Just because I've done that, you know, you, you, it doesn't. You can't that's make a... killing right by killing someone. That's the, yeah, the, the, yeah. In fact, mm -hmm. that's the entire point of being opposed to killing is that it's wrong even if you do it yeah exactly so yeah and that's the logical fallacy to say just because i do something you know or i use something that's available to me you know because okay. what i see is wrong it's not you know i, I think it's called follow. a fallacy fallacy actually there's something called <laughs> oh, yeah. fallacy fallacy, fallacy. fallacy. <laughs> it's crazy <laughs> that's, that's, that's the... why i'm not a philosopher this <laughs> there's so many crazy <laughs> fallacies oh god i know i've seen the list that's massive <laughs> like because you get the 42 basic ones and then it can be endless springing off from all yep. the other ones but yep. um what I wanted to say as well is one thing I liked about um, when I was reading Against Intellectual Property was the appendix at the end and you had the questionable examples of patents and copyrights and I thought some of them were hilarious. I don't know if you have a favourite because I know I do. Uh, uh, <laughs> is it the condom one? Oh no. That that's, was that, mine. Uh, yeah, that was that mine. close second. <laughs> it, plays, it plays Dixie. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. My favorite one was the what was that hyper tight speed speed antenna that poke poking a hole in another dimension to transmit yeah. RT waves to faster than light at faster than light. I, I love that one. I read the whole thing. I love that patent. It's it's uh, it, but in a way that's ridiculous. But that's an example of a patent that's not a danger because it's so it's so obviously flawed that if they tried to assert it, it just there's no one you can sue for it. No one's actually doing yeah. that. And so, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that list, of course, is way out of date by now. That was like 2000, 1999 to 2000. And I've collected yeah. a lot yeah. more since then. If I've given up collecting, there's so many. <laughs> oh, every, wow. It's know, gotten every, worse. Every... <laughs> because some of them are just unbelievable. Like the Christmas tree watering system because it's what shaped like Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's, that's mm -hmm. absolutely it's crazy. It's insane. But wasn't but, there like uh, I think there was a guy sentenced j in Britain just like mm -hmm. a month ago to like three years in prison for uploading a movie? Oh, was that the one we were talking about? Was that know. no? That was the guy recording a film. Yeah, the that one, was the, uh, the guy one recording was, a film. Yeah, was the guy the recording theater. a film. He a, yeah, he made a copy yeah. with his phone or something. And yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, aye. I. I think it's ridiculous things like that. I mean, I've always had my views about. Um, you know, music and films available online. Uh, you know, Napster. We all know Napster. Me, Dan, and I used it as teenagers. Well, that's interesting. How? What did you think when Napster came along? Well, my kind of my first uh, fairly uh, widespread article on IP was at LouRockwell.com. Right before my yeah, yeah. against IP, it was uh, it was about Napster. It was like uh, in defense of Napster. Yeah. And against the second, so I used that as an example to kind of show what I thought was the fundamental flaw of the entire pro IP approach, which is I call the second homesteading rule. So they're undercutting yeah. homesteading by saying that instead of identifying the owner of a resource by asking who, who owned it first mm -hmm. or who got it by contract from a previous owner, they simply say someone else has a better claim to it because they created it or whatever. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's a way of undercutting the basic homesteading rule that under, uh, that's the undergirding structure of all of Western legal theory and po political systems. Um, it's it's hard to express these things without going into legal language or to yeah. political yeah. language, but to me it's so intuitively obvious by now. Um, and I think you mentioned earlier um, that um, kind of the, the, the origins of these laws, which you could say they were in England in the 1615 hundreds, but 
in a way, they go back even further. I think the earliest case I'm aware of is uh, 500 something BC in the Greek wow. city state of Sybaris. There was like oh. this uh, culinary competition. So they would mm. have like a, a cook off, basically. Who got who comes up with the best recipe? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the, the little king or whatever their leader was called would grant a one year monopoly to the winner. So they would be the only one who could make that dish for a year. <laughs> <laughs> so that was their reward for yeah. the, it'd be like if Iron Chef now UK <laughs> the guy that wins no one else can make this dish for a year uh, of course now oh, it would man. be 95 years or something or 117 years or something um, um, so the origins can go back wait uh, a long time and, and there was some of this back in the early um, uh, times of the law merchant there was these uh, protectionist sort of monopolies being given out but it really reaches heyday right around the time of the uh, Statute of Monopolies in 1623 and uh, the Statute of Anne in 1710 with, with the copyright law. So the origins of these things go back a few centuries, and uh, it's clearly rooted in protectionism and uh, mercantilism and in thought control and censorship. I, it's It stuns me that libertarians – who you would think would be the first to see this, right? Because we're the yeah. ones that are most consistently against monopoly and protectionism and thought control and censorship. Yep. These are like the paradig paradigmatic cases of this, and they led to what we have now. And libertarians are just like, oh, no, it's a property right. No, it's a property <laughs> right. I just want to say, are you – you're kidding me. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, their answer is, well, if I want to write a poem, how, how am I going to get paid? So their answer is a stupid <laughs> question. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah. It's, not, it's not an answer. It's not an argument. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. And absolutely. And, and, and just something I was interested in, um, and just in case the NSA or GCHQ are listening, I have never illegally downloaded a film. Ever. No, never. But, but just let's say I had, for talk's sake, um, what, say I downloaded like one or two films and someone had found out about it. What would the penalty be? I mean, do they is this a slap on the wrist, or are they more serious about this kind of thing? Well, okay, so the the law varies from country to country, of course. Oh yeah, I just mean from what yeah. you know, yeah, in the U.S., yeah. And the U.S. is pretty much the worst, although the U.K., Canada, uh, they they're slowly emulating what we've done. Um, and yeah. this is one problem with this network of free trade agree so-called free trade agreements, like the. Uh, like in the U.S., the NAFTA and uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, the 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 WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, all these so-called in these these upcoming free trade they, they 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 call them free trade agreements, but they sneak in these IP provisions where they require Canada, Spain, Africa, Euro, you know Europe, uh, Russia, China, Brazil, whatever. They require them to start increasing up their IP protection to match the U.S. standards. Um, so there's a ratcheting effect where, by which – an imperialist effect by which the West and the U.S. impose this Western scheme on other countries. So they're all getting pretty bad. Um, but the, the criminal penal – the penalties for copyright are not trivial uh, at all. In the U.S., it can be $75,000 to $150,000 civil penalty per oh, wow. work. So wow. if you upload 20 music files, that you're getting close to a million dollars. Oh jeez, oh, and and they're criminal <laughs> penalties. I mean, and like wow. I said, this uh, there's one man who uploaded one copy of the the Wolverine movie about four years ago in the U.S. Yeah, and he's in jail. He went to federal prison for a year. <clears throat> um, and this guy in uh, in Britain, I forgot his name. Um, like I said, he just got sentenced to three years for uploading this uh, this movie he recorded in the theater. Um, and there's a a British uh, an English. Um, Student named Richard Dwyer, D W Y E R, who was uh -huh. just a grad student, and he he had a website, and on his website he had hyperlinks, linking to other websites, which yeah. had these kind of Russian pirated files or whatever. He didn't have anything on his server at all, and under U.S. law, that's potentially a copyright infringement, but it's not under British law. But right. the U.S. said, well, he's violating U.S. law. And the internet's international, and therefore we're going to use our extradition treaty, criminal extradition treaty with Britain, and force this wow. guy to stop his <clears throat> graduate studies in England, come to America to face federal prison charges, 
criminal charges no. for having a website with hyperlinks on it. No. I just I find I that heard ridiculous. I have the final status of this, but it disrupted this guy's life, and it may have ruined his life. I don't know. Um, th these are just one of many examples. Um, and, and not only that, we have these um, these escalating uh, provisions in in Europe, in France, in the U.S. now. Like in the U.S., it's called six strikes and you're out. And it's, it's, oh. under, it's under the provision of the ISPs, but of course they did it in response to pressure from the government. So if you have uh, some uh, – broadband service at your home mm -hmm. and and uh, they give access to uh, the, the Hollywood or the music studios and they detect that one of the users of this service has downloaded an illegal file then they'll send you a warning and you have a way wow. to respond and then it will escalate up to what's called six strikes and if you get the six strikes you could lose your right to use internet for life oh my god and this is, this <laughs> is not even crazy. a government proceeding it's just like a sort of quasi private proceeding with very little due process uh, and extremely um, 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 uh, uh, you know severe penalties um, uh -huh. that you could, you could face so they had the, the the copyright system is like a big mafia I mean if you rent a movie you've seen this before probably even in your country the FBI warning comes up and warns oh you. gosh yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're just trying to watch a movie with your friends, and you get an FBA warning. I mean, <laughs> so this is not uh... this is not a joke. It's it's serious stuff, and they are they will they will put their customers in jail to try to keep extracting monopoly payments from them. Madness. It's absolutely insane, <laughs> Stefan. I, I'm kind of I know I'm changing the subject a little bit here and I don't want to be rude but I I'm really eager to ask you about something um, on our show. We, we we've expressed our um our love for home education um we we have talked a lot about it and something you've mentioned before is montessori education uh, could you go into that a little bit for us I'll, I'll tell you what i've learned i have one son he's 11 years old so yeah. uh i'm not um, a parent of many children so my experience is limited but i've learned what i've learned yeah and um i looked into it when he was very young because i started when you're a young parent you start thinking about these things of course mm. and i had always heard about montessori because they're heavily promoted by the randians but even though i was kind of a randian i always <laughs> discounted montessori because most <clears throat> randians don't have children so i, I figured <laughs> if they're promoting montessori it must be something kind of wacky yeah um, well <laughs> so there was one down the road from where i lived and uh, i decided to look into it um just because it was one of the ones on my list and the more I learned about it, the more I realized it's it's a really uh, I see why Rand liked it. It's individualist, it's reason based, yeah. it's pro child centered. I know a lot of libertarians are moving towards um, uh, homeschooling and even unschooling now, and I understand that, and I'm not against that at all. Um, I'm still a sort of pro division of labor kind of guy and pro specialization of of, um, of labor. And um, I know that parents can do a remarkably good job uh, raising their children without a specialty degree, but mm -hmm. I think that's a commentary on how bad the, the government schools are <laughs> rather than how well, great yeah. parents can be. Um, so uh, my, the view I've settled on is I think Montessori is a really good system. It, it's uh, it's pro-peace. It's pro-reason. Um, uh, it is private. It can be more expensive, although I think it is there are public or government versions in, in, in other countries. Yeah. Um, I like how it doesn't have the traditional testing model. They don't even give grades initially because they're focused on the individual. They use a verbal assessment yeah. instead of a quantitative assessment, which is kind of intuitively more in line with sort of the Misesian or Austrian view of – understanding and analyzing human action i think i don't think they realize that but i see some connections um so i just love it i love the approach i like the uh, yeah. personally i like the uh, the association montessori international the ami that's the original montessori curriculum that's based in amsterdam now i believe oh mm -hmm. really okay it, it was started in italy of course with maria montessori but it's based yeah. in amsterdam now um there's a there's a whole we can't go into it now probably there's a sure. whole, there's a whole interesting history of mm -hmm. why Montessori started gaining popularity in the U.S. at least in the early 1900s and then fell out of favor because of some hatchet job done by some guy like a Jewite 
uh, central <laughs> progressive planner kind of guy, and his hatchet job did the trick for a couple of decades, and then the wars happened, and so it, it sort of got knocked out of favor, and so yeah. AMI, uh -huh. AMI almost disappeared here, and then a woman named Nancy Rambush, I believe, went to Europe in the 40s or 50s, and discovered this amazing Montessori approach and tried to bring it back here. But by that time, AMI had disappeared here. So she started the AMS, the American Montessori Society. It's almost like uh, uh, the Protestant Reformation, you know, like the Protestants versus the Catholics. <laughs> yeah. So she yeah. started the American version because she had no choice because AMI had atrophied. AMI is now gaining steam again <clears throat> here, and um, it's still a minority. But um, anyway, I, I, I appreciate both the AMS and the AMI approach, and I don't know what the other mainstream approaches are in, in Europe and other countries, but uh, it's heavily reason-based. I don't agree with every approach they have as a parent. Mm -hmm. I've yeah. seen things I've done differently than they teach. But <clears throat> what I like about them is everything they do, they have a good reason for. So, sure. for example, yeah. they teach writing before reading, and they teach cursive, and they teach cursive before print. Now, you may disagree with one or two of those things, but, but if you ask them why, they will give you a good, solid reason, and it's from the sure. point of view of the child. And so I like that perspective and that focus, um, and I, I just haven't seen that among um, teachers that I know in the regular school system. They just do what they've been told. They put the kids in a grid. They lecture to them. They use strict discipline, and it's just like a brute force method. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I agree, and I understand there's another feature not that um... – Correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that a lot of the time kids are kept in maybe with the same teacher for a number of years as opposed to just one year. Yeah, so the original Montessori system, the official curriculum, as I understand it, at least for AMI, only goes to sixth grade. After that, it's it hasn't been officially approved yet, although the system is 100 years old. So the official Montessori system starts at 18 months or 14 months and goes to uh, sixth grade. Oh, right. And, and the theory is that uh, by empirical observation of Montessori and her followers, they believe that, <clears throat> that human beings develop in um, in four six-year stages of development, and each of those oh, is yeah. divided into three-year planes of development. So they think zero to three is one plane, three to four, three to six is another plane, etc. So they group them into the classroom by those planes of development because the plane of development of the child appropriate to their stage of learning determines the type of environment and learning material they should have. Sure. So – and the other advantage is um, – well, there's two other advantages. So my, my, my son is now in sixth grade, so he's on his third year now with the same teacher, one teacher. All right, yeah. And actually in Italy, they don't call them teachers. They call them guides because the idea is that the kid teaches yeah. themselves. So it's a lot hmm. similar to this – homeschooling and unschooling idea except it's more systematic and it's got a longer pedigree sure i, I sometimes think that the homeschoolers and the unschoolers are trying to reinvent the wheel and mm -hmm. they're also yeah. doing it for political reasons sometimes like to fight against the government or are they doing it because they just can't afford uh, a private education so they have these yeah. i don't want to say excuses but they have reasons they give that are not quite the best reason to prefer that Look, if that's all you can afford, that's fine. Homeschooling is probably fine. But I think a private, good Montessori school, if you can find it. Um, so one advantage is that when you're a fourth grader, let's say, in what they call upper elementary, yeah. then you're the youngest kid in the class, and the older kids take care of you. They're your mentors. Mm. And then by the time you progress to be the sixth grader, now you're the mentor. So it teaches you both sides of things, and it also encourages harmony because these kids are helping each other. Yeah. You know, it's like a little brother or a little sister. You're not going to fight with someone that your your job is to help teach and take care of. Um, and you'll have one teacher for three years in a row. So the teacher gets to know the child very well, and when you have an occasional meeting with the teacher, she gives you a verbal report. She tells you your son did this this semester. I, you know, It's not just like a bunch of statistics that – the, the government told you to collect. It's actually a verbal report of their, of the teacher's assessment of the kid's development. And so, I appreciate all of that. 
Oh yeah, absolutely, and it's actually quite fascinating. We could probably go on for ages about it. We will definitely. Li- we we're going to link up some information about that um, underneath in the show notes. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. Well, the, the other so... thing, by the way, uh, uh, one thing that's slightly libertarian related, although I don't think she realized yeah. it, mm-hmm. is that the, part of the emphasis was that Montessori believed that the only way to transform human nature was by educating the children and have the next generation come up that was pro peace. Yeah. Now yeah. it's a little that's a little utopian in the sense, <laughs> especially yeah. because Montessori, for example, is only you know one percent or whatever of the. But you could see what she was getting at. What we libertarians oh, yeah. get at is that we have to educate the next generation in peace and in mm-hmm. cooperation and the message of liberty somehow. Oh yeah, no, I would I would absolutely agree with you. I would totally agree with that. I think that's it's a good philosophy to have. Um, so Stefan. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Um, Why don't you tell us a bit about your website and anything else you would like to plug? Uh, Well, I I blog on occasion on a couple of places, but um, I have my IP stuff at c4saf.org. It stands for Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. But everything can be found at stephankinsella.com. I would say most people nowadays... Uh, think of me as an IP guy, and I understand that. Um, yeah. But I just want to say it's it's never been my main my main interest. I just did it because I felt I had to, and m- most people I heard talking about it got it wrong or didn't understand IP law. Of course. Yeah. So because I was an IP lawyer, I thought I, I had to say what I thought on this. Um, but my main interest has always been rights theory, you know, basic oh, really? libertarian theory. So I've written a, a lot on that and legal theory, and I do have a book coming out um, in a few months, hopefully. Oh. It's a collection of my essays with some changes, but um, it's called Law in a Libertarian World. So um, That's interesting because that was something that we even asked about, so yeah. we'll definitely need to check that out. Something yeah. that we're definitely interested in. Yep, so I appreciate your interest, and thank you guys for the uh, wonderful conversation. Yeah, thanks so much. So for more libertarian podcast writings and news, visit greeningoutpodcast.co.uk. Thank you for being with us today's debate. Stefan, thanks so much. Thank you.